Welcome back to another episode of The Morning Buzz. I'm your host, Russell Gahagan, and this is The Morning Buzz Fishing Show, uh, sponsored by Torquey Coffee. And today we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun this morning. We're going to sort of roll reversal here. Uh, I've got my good friend Matt Clinton uh, on today, uh, who would normally be the guest, but we talked, and what we're going to do here is we're going to flip, and Matt's going to host the show, and I'm going to be the guest. And we're going to talk uh, basically the Sheboygan Salmon Cup recap. Uh, so last weekend here in Sheboygan, there was a fishing tournament. And uh, we're going to just basically do a little recap of the tournament. And uh, I'm going to pass the, the host duties over to Matt now. How are you this morning, Matt? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for letting me do this. This <clears throat> excuse me. This is something we always do after an event, right? I would come up there, we would drink about two pots of coffee and I would listen to you, even if I fished in the event with you, but especially if not, go back from pre-fishing, you know, what the expectations were going into the event, how it went, your decision-making during it. And I always end up leaving those conversations, having learned a thing or two. Often I end up having more questions and I think it helps me my hope here is to keep this conversational and as natural as possible. In a perfect world, we essentially have that conversation, but in public, which can be dangerous, but I think could actually be really helpful to a lot of people. People want to, as scary as it can be, get in your head. And, you know, we were just talking and I was asking some folks around about, you know, what this victory meant and, and, and just, I mean, this is the seventh, I think, Salmon Cup. Do I have that right? Yeah, yep. Yeah, that's that's a bunch. Uh, that's seven of fifteen or something like that, or Twelve. is it? Uh, yeah, okay. So <clears throat> you're now better than a coin flip shot against the field. This is this is Tiger Woods in two thousand and two thousand one, right in golf, where he's just winning every other tournament he's he's golfing in. So um, what I don't want to do is get too caught up in the weeds, but I do want to make sure we cover everything. So. Can you just first give me an impression all the way back from the spring? You've talked about this spring potentially being really special, and and broadly it has been, but that doesn't mean on any given day they're going to bite, right? So a week or two ago, you and I were having a conversation, and you know you sort of indicated, like, this could be tough. I feel maybe like there, there ought to be fish around that don't appear to be around where they ought to be. Uh, was that, do I have that right kind of going into the event and then maybe just given an impression, you know, on weeks before or a full week before even pre-fishing where your head was on what you thought the event would be and what you thought you were going to Yeah, do. so it's interesting. We've had a, an amazing spring uh, of fishing, which I, I did, as you said, I did allude to, I thought, quite a ways early into the deal. Um, already in February, I thought we were going to have a pretty pretty great spring fishery and we did and Sheboygan saw coho fishing for the first time in a few years uh you and I fished out of port quite a bit and just I mean really just flat out smashed fish um you know we went to Milwaukee um and had some success we went to Racine um so I mean uh fishing all up and down the Wisconsin shoreline basically from Sheboygan south was really really good this spring and then all of a sudden we hit this weird deal that I haven't maybe ever seen before or not to that magnitude, which was a May Northeast <laughs> cold front, um, which is. And it was wild. I mean, like three yeah, days. So very un, um, unnormal, unnatural, whichever term you want to use, uh, very rare uh, that we have a severe, severe cold front in May of, like you said, three days lasting of big waves, cold weather and lots of wind. <clears throat> and, and it basically put the brakes on is what it did. Um, the fish are here. I don't think the fish ever went anywhere. There's been kings around the, mm. the Sheboygan, Port, Manitowoc, you know, the general vicinity area here for, you know, three weeks already or more. <laughs> um, they normally tend to show up around Salmon Cup in early June. Well, they've been here. Um, we've been sort of progressed a couple of weeks ahead for a while. But what happened was that cold front put the brakes on and, and really put the fish in a funk. And oddly enough... This is the twist I can't uh, explain, and, and nobody, I don't think, can explain everything that happens out in Lake Michigan, but this is the twist I can't explain. Two or three days prior to Salmon Cup, I, they came out of the funk, and I thought, wow, 
you know, I made a comment to a couple people, you know, we can weigh five fish a day in the, in the pro division. I said, somebody's going to weigh 210. Nobody's done that before, by the way. Mm. Um, somebody's going to weigh yeah. 210, you know, which is 100 one day, 110 the other or whatever, which is basically like a 21 pound average, which is really big. Um, mm -hmm. Last year, I think it took a 17 pound average to win. I think the year before it took around a 17 or 18 pound average to win. Um, and it took 30 pounders to win yeah. big fish. Yep. It took. It, there so yeah. leading into pre-fishing, it looked like it was turning around. The fishing was, was pretty darn good. Um, you know, there was a fair amount of nice kings being caught. There was this wild card of some really nice lake trout being caught pretty much all spring. Um, so it was like, huh, you know, mm -hmm. guys could probably put a couple big boxes together. Uh, and so my expectation was that the, you know, the results and what you needed to have and catch, uh, were going to be pretty large. And then the thing that tends to happen in 75% of tournaments happened which is the fish realized it was tournament weekend and everything got tough. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me pause you there before you get into the tournament weekend itself, because you're weak. <clears throat> and again, some of this, I think you might take for granted. Maybe you don't. I mean, you've really transitioned yourself from a tournament angler primarily to a shop owner and tackle designer Maybe that was your primary objective or one of your primary objectives. Now, you know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I feel like educator is probably title one, then the rest. And it doesn't mean necessarily that you're sort of in dereliction of duty in these other areas, but I'm around the shop occasionally. You and I chat. I know how many people you talk to. I know how many questions you answer. I know how many people show up to your seminars. Um it almost has to be. I mean, you, you have to be an educator first, um, just as a result of the volume day in and day out of all of that. So from an educational standpoint, just walk me for a minute or two through. You you bring the boat down, was it Wednesday from yep. Door County Yep. last week? Tuesday was brutal fog. Wednesday, you come down. And why do you do what you do on Wednesday? What so do you do? In the plan originally was to bring the boat down Tuesday and then pre-fish Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And as you <laughs> said, there was some pretty dense fog on, on Tuesday, so we decided to hold off on that. So Wednesday, um, the boat that I fish on is parked in Sturgeon Bay, so we brought the boat down. And I have won this tournament a couple of times up in the Manitowoc area. Uh, one of the things that tends to happen around this time of year is Manitowoc slash two rivers, which is a lot of people take them as one because they're so close, um, their salmon fishing kind of gets going right around the same time as Sheboygan's, their king fishing. Uh, but the advantage to that area is they do not see even close to the amount of local pressure that Sheboygan sees. Um, Port Washington sees more even yet, in my opinion. Um, Port Washington sees a, an immense yeah. amount of local pressure. Sheboygan sees a, a pretty large amount of local pressure. And then, you know, there's a, lo a huge drop off um, of local fishing pressure in Mantuac and Two Rivers comparison to those other two ports. So I feel like I've had some success over the years fishing those, you know, fishing that stretch of water, that Mantuac Two Rivers, mainly because those fish just aren't uh, pressured as much. So naturally, because we um, have to go right past there to power home, decided that that was as good a time as any to stop there and fish. And we did, and we did not have any, any real success. We caught a couple of fish, but nothing really that we were looking for or anything like that. So um, truthfully, we kind of scratched that off the list already on Wednesday. And, you know, we fished there for probably three hours or so and then brought the boat back and parked it. And, and you know, at that point it was Thursday, Friday was going to be the was going to be the rest of the pre-fish. And it was pretty much decided at that point that we were going to fish within you know, the relative vicinity of Sheboygan. How, how, how much good news and bad news is it that they're not biting in two rivers and, and Manitowoc for you and your boat and your likelihood of success? Um, I think it's more bad than good. Uh, the, the only, you know, the only good news is probably two or three of the top boats that are competitors in this event are from <laughs> two rivers. So naturally they have, you know, more knowledge than I do there and they have more contacts than I do there and they have, you know, just an ability to be successful there. But, um, with that said, if we stay close to Sheboygan and the bites out of Sheboygan, there's anybody that's pretty much in the tournament is has a really good chance. Mm -hmm. If they're biting way, way better in Manitowoc and Two Rivers than they are in Sheboygan and only three of us run up there, then it you know, 
first, second, and third, unless something rare happens, should come from those three boats. So uh, I do like it if the bite is like that. Um, it just it gives me an advantage because I'm not afraid to go there. But on the other mm-hmm. hand, um, you know, I've always said I'm willing to you know, to basically draw a two mile box and everybody fishes inside that box and let's find out who the best fisherman is. So I'm going to resist, I'm going to resist taking that bait. Cause I want to talk about that at some point with you. And maybe we'll do that on another one. The, the perfect tournament rule set, so mm-hmm. to speak. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I say it genuinely, that is very tempting to run down that rabbit trail, but we're going to stay on, on salmon cup, at least for, for a while here. Sure. Um, okay, so <clears throat> Wednesday unfolds, Manitowoc, put the boat in the slip, Thursday morning you wake up, and now now you've really just got two straws to draw, right? You need to go check a couple of things, and, and you're obviously also chatting with some other folks, just like they are, right? Everybody's talking. I, I joked with some guys in the shop, I, I think I was there Thursday night to to drop something off or pick something up. I, you know, I was planning on just going fishing with the family or something over the weekend, or maybe, maybe you had somebody who was coming to port and I was picking something up. Anyway, it, that, that whole shop has a different feel Thursday night before salmon cup than it ever has. Suddenly nobody's catching them. Suddenly it's, it's so, so like, I don't know. We got a couple. Uh, it's hilarious, right? I mean, guys who just do nothing but want to help and talk have nothing to say and so i just basically stop asking because i don't want to make them lie to me right it's just it's just such a funny feeling so you wake up now thursday morning hop on the boat walk me through that day why'd you do what you did and and what happened well a couple things number one i had obviously put some feelers out to see if there was anything going on any long distance from sheboygan i know the bite in milwaukee is really really good but it wasn't good enough to run 50 miles um, mm-hmm. there wasn't anything major going on in port. I obviously leaned on you for some Intel there. Um, and it, it, there wasn't anything special going on there. So it didn't, you know, appear to me like a 25 mile run was in place. So at that point, basically on Thursday morning, I made the decision that, you know, I was going to fish kind of how I normally would fish out of town, uh, which is interesting, but, um, you know, I was going to basically go straight out and turn North on Thursday And then on Friday, I was going to turn straight out and turn south and make long passes. And that's how I like to do a lot of pre-fishing because then uh, I can just cover a lot of water. I don't turn around on any fish. Um, You know, we get bites. I don't turn around, go back through there, things like that. I make long passes um, and I like to make a lot of angled passes. And what I mean by that is a lot of, you know, northeast, northwest, northeast, northwest to cover different depths, you know, and not get stuck in one depth of water. So... Uh, Thursday morning, we went out, we set up basically straight out of Sheboygan and we turned the boat north and, uh, well, we turned the boat northeast in a hundred foot of water and uh, we got our first bite in about 130 and basically worked, you know, 120 to 140 after that, kind of zeroing that in from straight out all the way north of the Pigeon River and fished for about, I don't know, I think we fished about 530 to 11. And Thursday was special. Um, it was really special. So we had, I think, seven or eight adult kings. Um, mm. Missed a couple. And uh, we caught a 20-pound lake trout and a, a handful of other fish probably or so. But we had something really unique going on on Thursday um, that I had kind of prepped for all winter. And it's one of the things you talked about you know, just a little bit ago where you said, you know, we talk all winter and you kind of prepare and this is the first tournament. So some of those sort of things you want to try, things you want to do, they come out right. in the first one, right? And of course, they're going to come out a bunch here going forward, but they come out in the first one for sure because you've been working on it, waiting on it all year. And one of the things that, you know, I've been waiting to do is is play with these new salmon candy fish blades and mm-hmm. We got a little program going with uh, with both sizes, you know, with the 12-inch and the 10-inch. And uh, one, the, the bigger one here, the 12-inch, and not this particular color, although this was one of the colors. Um, here's a 12-inch salmon candy uh, fish blade okay. with double fins on the back of it. Um, we got, uh, this is blue stud. We got we got that one going on, on, on a diver with a meat rig behind it. And then... Uh, we did a little fishing with the 10-inch, you know, model, which is smaller, 
Um, this is a Mountain Dew stud, mm -hmm. not necessarily this particular color, but we got we got something going with these with flies behind them. And it's something that I tested yeah. last year and you and I talked a little bit about, you know, before we yeah. wanted to make these, obviously. And it's something that I told you I thought was going to be real special going forward, and I, I'm going to stick by that. You know, we're, we're going to have a conversation a year or two from now, and a 10-inch fish blade, salmon candy fish blade with a fly is going to be somewhat of a staple for guys around here sure. to catch kings. Yeah, guys are going to have one out Absolutely. just in case. Absolutely. Thursday. Yep. Or, or, yep. or maybe have one or two out all the time because they just flat sure. out work. Um, yeah. and so Thursday came and, 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 you know, we had this really, really great day and I'm going to be honest, I don't do this very often. Um, <laughs> but I sat on that boat Thursday morning about 10 o'clock and I thought to myself, it might be over. Like, you know, yeah. we got about a hundred and yeah. you might do this tomorrow yeah. and on Saturday or on, on Saturday and Sunday, you weren't going to go back. I wouldn't think, no. uh, and beat up in fish again, but yeah, it, this could just, right. We sitting there with five Rinse kings for 116, 117 pounds, not even counting the 20 pound lake trout that would have probably made it a little bit more. Um, and yeah. I'm looking at it going, you know, nobody else is going to have six fish blades on their rods. You know, this is, this is, you know, this is pretty special. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, if this continues, um, you know, it's over, it's just flat out over. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I went to bed Thursday night pretty excited. I obviously conversated with you, um, told you kind of what was going on. It was an exciting deal. And mm -hmm. that was all great. Um, in the background, you know, I knew that there was a lake trout bite going on, and I had that sort of in my back pocket. And that's been going on all spring. And it's progressively just mm -hmm. gotten deeper and deeper, which it also does every year. So every year what happens with lake mm -hmm. trout is they come to the shoreline when the bait fish do. Uh, which is usually late April, early May, um, and, and they feed on those bait fish, and you can catch them in 10, 20, 30 feet of water. And then when the bait... And that's the same time, I'm sorry to interrupt, that's the same time the brown trout fishing dies, yep. right? Because you talk about that in the seminars, how the, the bait fish flood the shoreline, and you instantly can't compete. But w what I'm hearing from you, and this is this is really just a public version of a conversation, I'd have, been, I'd have interrupted you if we weren't on a podcast to say, does that mean I need to be thinking... All right, I can't brown trout fish. I want to fish. There aren't kings around. I'm in Sheboygan and there aren't cohos. I'm lake trout fishing now, and they're probably around. Are they so stuffed up in those pods of bait that I'm not going to catch them, or are there some on the outside edges? Uh, both. So there will be some in the pods of okay. bait that will be much more difficult to catch. Um, and what will happen is the way you'll know the brown trout bite is dying is you'll stop catching brown trout and you'll start catching lake trout almost immediately. It's like an mm -hmm. immediate reaction. Um, the minute your, okay. your 10 to 20 foot of water program becomes predominantly lake trout, the brown trout fishing is over and the bait fish have hit the shoreline. Um, but you primarily target those lake trout in the spring just outside of the bait. So 30, 40, 50 feet of water type of thing, right? Um, and it's not that, it's not that the, the lake trout aren't pile driving into 10 foot of water to feed. They are. It's just there's so many of them that they, they don't all go in there. And the ones in 30, 40, 50 feet of water, you know, are a lot easier to catch. Okay. So, okay. so they progressively get into that shallow water. And then when the bait fish goes back out into the lake, which it does always mid late May, you know, the lake trout follow it. And, and what happens is those lake trout is the water's real cold in May. We'll set up in 50, 60, 70 foot, and we'll catch them in there, bounce in the bottom. Um, and then they'll just kind of start working their way out as the water warms up. Well, something weird happened this year, not weird, but you know, unnormal which is, you know, we had a lot of warm water, warm weather in May, which created much warmer water than normal. I think you and I went fishing <clears throat> Memorial Day weekend where I would normally see 44 degree water down 40. We saw like 49 to 50 degree water down 40. Um, that's a right. pretty big difference. That's like mid to late June stuff. So uh -huh. what happened was the lake trout ended up getting out into deeper water. And when I say deep, you know, not all of them, but uh, but the bigger ones, especially that prefer the real cool water, they got out into that 160 all the way out to 220 and basically down on the bottom mm -hmm. or near the bottom. So mm -hmm. um, I had that program in my back pocket and I wasn't going to pre-fish that because I have enough confidence in lake trout fishing that that wasn't something that I knew I needed to do. Um, it was just more about, hey, if, you know, and on <clears> Thursday, <throat> I'll be honest, I had no thoughts of this. Hey, if 
Right. That, that didn't seem like if I had told you you were going to have to weigh trout on Saturday and Sunday, you're like, what's right. about to happen? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So Thursday, I didn't have any thoughts of lake trout, but I did know that I had that in my back yeah. pocket. So um, yeah. Friday morning comes, and now we plan, okay, we're going to go out, and we're going to do what I said. We're going to do the opposite. So we're going to go straight out, and we're going to turn it south. And I'd heard some pretty decent reports mm-hmm. on Thursday about, you know, uh, deficient to the south as well. Guys were catching them. So I thought, okay, you know, um, going to turn south and we're going to go. And, and I kind of had zeroed in 120 to 140 really being the depth that I was going to target at this point. There's a ton of bait on the inside. And one of the biggest mistakes I think a lot of guys made this weekend was they fished too shallow too long. I'm not going to argue at all that mm. at first light, the place to be if you want to catch a king salmon it is probably, you know, 60 to 100 foot right now. There is so much bait in there. Mm-hmm. There are so many fish in there that, you know, that's the place loaded with fish. The problem with it is 5 a.m. the gun goes off, 520 you're set up, it's over. Like, for the right. most part, it's over. Right. That small window of super right. feed is pretty much over by 430 a.m. right now because it's so light that that really, really mm-hmm. shallow water becomes really difficult to fish. So I kind of figured out that I was going to target that 120 to 140 because I felt real comfortable with that depth of water and then biting, you know, uh, longer into the day there and things like that. So, so we set up and we make a pass and, um, it was okay. Uh, I think we ended up boating three adult Kings and losing two, but one of the things that, uh, happened on Friday was we had one bite on the fish blades. And that sort of created a, a red, red, red flag slash alarm for me. As a matter of fact, that's uh, panic mode. Yep, and like, yep. oh, it's not going to just be pile driving five kings a day for two days potentially. Here. Well, so what's interesting is, so then you go to yourself, you go, okay, so we got nine lines out. I had five or four fish blades on and, you know, four or five, I think it was four fish blades and five, eight inch salmon candy flashers. And you go to yourself Okay, now what? You know, because <laughs> yesterday you had the day of days. And today, every single fish you took that was the right fish and every single bite you took except for one that was the right fish were on, you know, the 8-inch stuff. So The stuff we won most of the tournaments yeah. on, certainly the ones we fished together, We've what we've won and succeeded in had been 8-inch flashers, flies, and some mm-hmm. meat, but not a lot of them. Right, so... Okay, I'm thinking, well, two things. Through the scuttlebutt of the phone, which is always part of the deal, right? Um, you, you know, you, everybody's talking to each other and trying to, you know, trying to figure out what's going on without showing their hand, you know. When they when they put your statue up at the Freshwater Fishing Hall oh, of Fame, boy. you know, people have, like, they're setting the up or whatever. Yours is going to be on yeah, the phone. could be. Like, you know, frustrated on the back deck of a boat talking to somebody, yep. right? Uncle Terry's on the line or whoever, you know, somebody, somebody's on the receiving end of what's going on. I always say that it's real easy for me to get a handle on how good the fishing is and during the day of a tournament, because if within yeah. the first 45 minutes, my phone goes off a pile of times of people trying to get a hold of me, it's pretty slow. It ain't yep. good. If that you thing know, is, sure. they got way if that you. thing is dead silent, <laughs> we better be fighting them too, because everybody else is, that's for sure. Yeah, um for sure so you know i was trying to put the pieces together basically on friday of okay what happened and basically what i found out you know kind of through the phone and back at the shop like you said you know guys are coming in buying stuff and you know they're trying to play the same card i'm trying to play on them which is you know we're not lying to each other but we're trying to get a feel you know we're playing that tug of war feeling game of trying to get a feel for how was today compared to yesterday for you it was a little tougher and it was blatantly obvious that Friday was tougher than Thursday right. in general. So like, okay, so the bites seeming to be doing this for whatever particular reason. Nobody really knows why, but at least it was for today. So we we made our pass. We went straight out. We trolled all the way past the Hattie, which is about seven miles from the harbor or so. So we got quite a, you know, quite a ways down and, and felt like we covered some water well. And we had one thing we got figured out that I thought was kind of unique. We had two bites on it late in the day. One was an adult salmon and one was a three-year-old that I was excited about. We hadn't had a downrigger bite on Thursday. 
And on Friday, I'm going, man, we got to, you know, I'd like to figure out a way to get a downrigger rod going. So I took, it was, it was, fl- it's flat calm mm-hmm. and it was supposed to be flat calm all weekend, right? And we had gotten a couple bites on Friday morning on some eight inch flasher flies. And I had been running, that's where I had been running one of the fish blades before. So I took it on the rigger was one of the places. Yep. So I took it off <clears throat> and that was the only one that didn't work, by the way. The only mm-hmm. one that really wasn't, you know, getting good action mm-hmm. uh, on Thursday. So I took it off, and I took a Green Jeans um, Salmon Candy Flasher, which is one of my favorites, mm-hmm. and stretched it back 251 feet behind the downrigger ball and dumped it 41 down. Mm-hmm. And here was my thought on it, right, guys? Like, why 251? We were getting bites on our outside pump boards. Sure. Even more than our middle and our inside. Sure. Those tended to be the best, and it didn't matter which one it was. We'd get a bite on the outside, we'd shuffle them out, meaning we'd move our middle to the outside, our inside mm-hmm. to the middle, and now this one's our inside. And the next one that seemed to go almost all the time was the outside again. Interesting. So I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> just get this thing, you know, miles behind the boat. We're gonna have to check it every time we want to put a pump out, you know, every time we turn. But you know, we're not turning a lot. We're just you know, we're doing a lot of straight line trolling. I'm glad you said that because the, when you said 251 back, I'm like, I you better get your players ready because that sounds like a tangle just looking for it. But in a tournament, I guess, what do you do? I mean, you pop it up five, 10 minutes, it's back down there. And yeah. if, no if, if you get 120 pounder on it on Saturday or Sunday, yep. more than worth the effort. So I stretch it back 251, put it down 41 feet, walk up front to. Uh, grab something, turn around, I'm coming back off the deck of the boat to walk down to the back deck, and it pops off and just starts screaming. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, that's good, right? So now I'm excited. So we get it. It's a 20-pounder. I think it was actually the biggest one of the day, like maybe 22 or something, and I'm like, okay, we got something figured out here. I put it back down, and like five minutes later, it takes off again with like 11 or 12-pound king. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wow, this is great, mm-hmm. right? So, so I'm fired up. So we've lost the fish blade program a little bit, but we've gained – the downrigger, which I felt like was a a real added bonus. Because if you'd have told me yeah. going into a tournament, you know, are you going to catch any on your downrigger? I'd have said, Kings, eh, if we get one, you know, that's a bonus. If we get two, whew, you know, we're well on our way to having a, a good weight, right? So, uh, so Friday finished up. We ended up with three adult Kings, missed two adult Kings that we definitely had on and fought. I was like, okay, you know, I don't think – South is the answer. I like the North water a little better. Um, we had a little better action there. It was a little more straight Kings. We definitely caught more odd fish or non King salmon, uh, to the South and the boat traffic, which was the biggest thing to the South was horrendous. Oh, um, which oh. was really my biggest decision of everything, even over the, um, catch from Thursday to Friday was boat traffic was bad. And, one thing I've learned about tournament fishing is this. If the fishing's really good, you can fish in boat traffic. That's okay. Mm-hmm. If it's just really, really good. If the fishing's not very good, which it, it, it wasn't overall for kings especially, um, if you're going to try to share a couple of fish with a whole bunch of guys, it's probably not going to work real well for you. Right. Yeah. So Friday night, basically, I'd already made the decision. We're going to go straight out. And we're going to make that north pass and we're going to work, you know, from straight out of Sheboygan to the Pigeon River back and forth in 120 to 140 for Kings. Are you running, <clears throat> you're running six pumps, a pair of wires and that rigor 251 back. That's the program. Yep. So the program was, uh, for, for Saturday morning, the program was eight ounce pumps on one side, 10 ounce pumps on the other, um, 80, 90, and 100 back on each one, and then two wires, um, one at a high setting, one at a low setting mm. on each side. So fishing one is a high wire and one is a low wire, and then the yeah. rigger, 251 back and 40, 41 down. <clears throat> and that all changed from Thursday. You know, Thursday was two wires, low settings, down deeper, you know, a rigger down deeper with a fish blade, with meat. Uh, a couple of fish blades on pumps on 10 ounces down a little further that all went away. So everything kind of went, uh, you know, a different mode then. Okay. The <clears> only <throat> thing we were going to keep true was one fish blade on, on 
Bubba, who's my brother-in-law who fished the tournament with me, he ran one side of the boat, which is your side that you would normally run if you were there. Um, he ran that side, and he left one meat rig on a 12-inch fish Megatron blade uh, mm-hmm. on a low setting on his side. That was We were going to leave that for Saturday morning. And that's a real big tip I can give the guys. I talk about this all the time when I do salmon schools. I talk about it in my videos. You absolutely cannot get stuck putting all your eggs in one basket. You can't, no matter what. Just don't do it. I wasn't going to do it. So even though Thursday was all fish blades, I didn't get stuck going all fish blades on Friday. You know, I left the eight-inch stuff out, and it was better, right? I didn't go get too worked up about it and just go full the other way and just go, okay, it's now it's all eight-inch blades on everything. We said, nope, we're going to put a fish blade on a wire down deep where it had got bit on Thursday. And if it gets bit, we'll just start firing out some more of them, right? I mean, but we're not going to... We're not going to go too crazy either way. We're going to let the fish tell us if they want it or not. Right. So we're going to put it on there. Okay. So Friday night came. Um, we had the captain's meeting, which was really awesome. It was uh, the record number of boats, which is 58 boats for the Sheboygan Salmon Cup. More That's than a winning, lot. Yeah. More, boats a lot. Yeah. More than winning the tournament, more than anything else. That was the most exciting moment of the weekend for me, um, for a guy who's ran this tournament since the day it, it started. Um and, and seen up, ups and downs from, you know, upper 40s to, to you know, mid-20s of boats throughout the years. Um, it was a pretty exciting moment for me. Uh, we had, you know, Tournament Trails, big sponsor founders outside, uh, you know, promoting yeah. their, their, their beer. Um, we had brats and hamburgers going. Um, and, and to me, it looked like there was a lot of people having a lot of fun. I saw a lot of smiles, a lot of laughing, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of goofing around. Um, and it, the really cool thing about the whole event was just the number of families you saw, right? There were a ton of kids chasing around out in the yard. The weather was phenomenal outside the just absolutely brutal sunburns that everyone managed to accumulate over Saturday and Sunday in that yard. Um, but it was, it really was a cool, just like environment. You know, it just, it, it really did seem super positive, um, across the board. You know, there were a bunch of spectators, there were a lot of people in Sheboygan who were like, what is going on here? Is this some, you know, why is there a tent here? Why is there mute? What is going on? So it just, it sort of drew a crowd because it drew a crowd, right? And there were just a lot of people sort of interested in it. It was, it was, it was really a cool thing. And I, I feel like maybe that was the difference between 40 boats and 58 boats, right? That it, it really you know, takes on a new character when you get that many more people um, invested in it you know, financially invested and emotionally invested in the, in the tournament. It was yeah, awesome. it really was a lot of fun. And um, I was glad to see all those boats show up. So we had the meeting and I could tell there were some guys that had caught some fish pre-fishing, but there were a lot of guys that had struggled. You know, that was. What do you mean? What do you mean you could tell? You The crystal ball? No, or you like, do you I'm really it? good at reading right. people. Right. And again, there's a lot of. So the guy that's got it figured out or he quote unquote thinks he does, doesn't ask a lot of questions. Yeah. It's another big mistake. (laughs) It's another big mistake that people make. I will ask as many questions if I had a great pre-fish as I will ask if I had a horrible one. 99% of people are not like that. If the normal guy who has a secret in his pocket walks up to you and talks about everything but the tournament, he's got a secret in his pocket. If he walks up to you and he's mm-hmm. like, Russell, you on him? He's got nothing. <laughs> you know, he's holding two se- he's holding two seven in his hand and he's praying for runner runner sevens. You know, I mean, so um and and that's just, you know, that's a great way, way to generally read people, in my opinion. Um And you've had two seven and you've had aces, yeah. you know, a hundred times each or whatever. You've fished enough times. I've had two sevens know, way more than I've had that. aces. For sure. Yeah, um, right. Let's be honest. Yeah. But you, you thought you had two aces on Thursday when you per- pulled the cards up. When you went to look back on Friday, <laughs> they had yeah. switched to, to about you know, four seven or yeah, something. Yeah, I think I, I would say I had king ten going into the weekend. I had possibilities, but right, surely not uh, pocket aces by any means. So, um, so yeah. So the atmosphere was great. I felt like um, we were going to have a great weekend. It was going to be a lot of fun, and I was looking forward to getting out there. And seeing what the you know the weekend brought, um, excuse me, I'm still recovered from it. Um, so so Saturday morning came, 
you know, the shotgun went off, everything was set. We had made our decision already, or I had, that we were going to go straight out, turn it north. We were going to work that area. One of the things that I also found interesting in pre-fishing that I think I'll, note, I'll make a note of quick is I, um, I didn't catch hardly anything prior to 6 a.m. We had zero, like, immediate bite going on, which I thought was odd. 6 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. was our window to catch big kings. The second thing of that was in two days, Thursday and Friday, I never had an adult salmon bite after 9 a.m., which was a little bit alarming to me. Now, we'd only stayed out till like 11, 11.30, but it's yeah. sort of been my, I don't know, sort of been my history to have this, you know, late morning flurry of nice salmon. Yeah. Um, and I was genuinely yeah. concerned about that. Genuinely. So Saturday morning came, we went out, we deployed the eight flasher and flies and the one flasher meat. Um, and Bubba actually got bit on his side on a pump while letting it out instantly, but it wasn't the right fish. It was a seven pound King, um, which we were happy to have it, you know, start, but, uh, you know, you'd always hope to put the rods out and bang, pop, pop that four year old right away and, and get off to a good start. Um, and that was actually um, that was actually one of our hottest flashers throughout the week, which was Ryan's Black Magic, which isn't one that I fish very often, mm. um, but it was one that you know my right. network of people had told me a few of them had said this was something that was working for them, so we tried it, um, and it worked for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so Ryan's Black Magic has some black in it. There's not a lot. Uh, is there black? Well, ice it's interesting. Or something? I was going to grab one to bring it, or sold out naturally. Um, there is some on the website though. Uh, which is good, but so it's a chrome blade. It's got a black edge, some green dots on it, and then on the back side, it's got UV solid tape with some green dots on it. It's a it's a really interesting flasher. Okay. Um, it's a really really good one. It's it's in my opinion one of the better fish catchers, um, but just hasn't you know it's just not something that I personally fish a ton um, over the years. So long story short, uh, that takes off right away on a pump, seven pound king, not the fish we're looking for, but it's okay. You know, get something in the boat and, and sort of get excited. Almost immediately when he gets that reset, his wire diver has a huge bite on the meat rig, but gets off instantly. I mean, just wire diver bends over like three thrashes of the rod and gone. So I don't know how to take that. You know, you're like, oh, dang it. You know, that was a good bite. But do you start firing out more meat? Do you just leave things alone? I made the decision. Right. I'm like, we're just going to let things ride here. Let's see what happens. Okay. So it's 530. We now go till about 10 after six or so without a bite. We hit a little dead spell. And then um, my outside pump fires with a four-year-old. And we get it. And I don't remember the exact size of that one, but that was a 10 ounce out 81 uh, with what ended up being the best flasher on my side all weekend, probably, which was Black Eyed Peas UV, which I ran because the yeah. Brickle beat down all over the Port Washington page has always got pictures of that. Yep. Shout out uh, Jesse Brickle. Brickle, yeah. Just a, a standard local guy, great fisherman, you know, has been having pictures of that thing all spring. So I thought, you know, should have it on. Um, and actually I didn't fish it till Saturday mm-hmm. morning, to be honest with you. Um, it just was some, yeah. So much confidence. Yeah. The brick will beat down. You don't, yeah. I just, it was a couple, to be honest with you, my side was pretty tough during the week and I'll admit that. So I, um, Bubba beat me up in pre-fish and the, t- the tide, the tide turned <laughs> Saturday morning quickly, but, um, and we'll go, we'll, we'll yeah. go into that for that sure. Amazing. But the, the tide turned, yeah. um, Saturday <laughs> morning, but, uh, I didn't have, I didn't have a lot. I didn't have a lot going on my side, so I was kind of like, "Well, um, you know, this is something I should run." So that one yeah. took off with a four-year-old. We got it, and then um, not real long after, my wire diver took off with Megatron on the outside, setting up high, and we caught that one. It was a four-year-old. So um, we had. So you did an eighty-one pump and a high diver now. They go. This is this is high in the yep, water column yep, so. stuff. And not super No, true. so it's now yeah. 6.45, 7 o'clock, you know, and we've got two four-year-olds, one on a high diver, one on a high pump. We're feeling pretty good. Um, we're like, okay, you know, we got two four-year-olds, small king. I think we boated a Laker maybe shortly after that, um, you know, and now we're sitting on four fish. And about 8 o'clock, we took another four-year-old, and that came on Bubba's side on a pump handle. Mm-hmm. 
on a Black Friday special flasher called Cryptotron. Um, that unfortunate. That is another Jesse Brickle beatdown yeah. flasher. That's another yeah, one. So the, the unfortunate part about that is because I'm super honest on what we catch them on, I have to tell you that that, that thing's been really good for a bunch of people, but it, you know, it won't be available for sale for a while yet. Um, but it's been really good. Mm-hmm. And it was a special thing we did on Black Friday, and you know it, it was it was really good. And um, so we took this the nice king on there. So now it's like probably eight thirty, eight forty five, and we've got you know three nice four year olds. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, we're in pretty good shape. You know, this is right where we need to be. And boy, just like every morning, you know, the brakes we hit the brakes, and you know. 10 o'clock came or so we're sitting on three, four year olds. we got a few other smaller fish and, you know, I'm thinking to myself, you know, what are we going to do? Right. And, and in the back of my mind, I'm going, you know, do we need to go trouting? Um, and, and this was a consistent thing in my mind. Do we need to go trouting? Do we need to go trouting? So about 1030, we, we haven't had another adult salmon bite, about 1030. Um, I grab a, cowbell and dump it down um on the middle rigger down to the bottom which is what i like to fish a lot for lake trout and we were still in that 130 range which really wasn't where i wanted to be for trout but um i thought well there's got to be some around i mean i'm sure there is dump one down there and i start bouncing the bottom with it and i immediately get an immense amount of slime all over it and if anybody's worked with that slime before you know it's really Mm -hmm. hard to get off you almost got to take the hose to it and stuff. So I pull it up to check it after five minutes and realize it's just, just caked with this slime everywhere. And I'm like, well, that was bad. So I take it off and just in a giant kind of hurry, I grab a Mountain Dew stud flasher and a different spinning glow and whip it on and put it down there on the bottom. But now near the bottom, not bouncing the bottom as I clean off the spinning glow and something really good but ended up sort of in some ways kind of bad happened. We immediately took a lake trout on it. Like immediately. It wasn't down there a minute and a half. Bang, mm-hmm. take a trout. And it's a nice one, like a 12 pounder. Okay. So why I say good and bad is it was really good because we wanted that fish. It was bad because it did two things. It made me keep the cowbell off, which was not the right decision. And it also, even more importantly, kept me working that depth of water instead of sliding out and trying to catch a couple nice trout. I convinced myself, well, let's just fish for kings with this one trout rod down. We caught one right away. We should be able to catch a few more. Mm -hmm. Um, And needless to say, Mm -hmm. the day ended up with no more. So we ended up having to weigh like a six-pound lake trout. And I was really frustrated about that. Like I came into the scale Mm -hmm. and I, I realized it after. I probably look like a jerk and I didn't mean to be, but you know, we weighed in and weighed the second biggest box of the day, but I probably looked like I caught two fish. Um, but it wasn't, it had nothing to do with our, our daily box. It had nothing to do with the position we were in. It was pure and utter disappointment in my decision. making. I felt like I gave up an opportunity for the team Mm. to truthfully be sitting in a position where we should have been, instead of down three pounds, we should have been up five to 10. And that's a really big difference in a five fish tournament. Mm. Really big. So that was a tough thing to mm. swallow, to be honest with you. Interesting. All right. So you, you close out day one here. You've got a top two box, but you're frustrated with this. And fishing is spotty enough. I mean, people don't really get an opportunity to to, to fish with you, but when you're tournament fishing and you're trying and you've tournament fish for so long in so many tournaments, like I, I, I joke around, I fish in a tournament every time I go, right. And you give me a hard time about it. I mean, I'm like Intel grabbing and trying my hardest and somebody's randomly coming into town and I'm like, but I really want them to catch them. Right. For you, because you've done so much tournament fishing and because frankly, you're just so much better at it. You don't, you don't have to try as hard or something, or, or you certainly don't make it look as hard. You try some different things, you test some new stuff, and lo and behold, most of the time, not every time, but most of the time, it it works, right? So when you start tournament fishing, 
and you do it more rarely now, and you're really, really trying. I mean, you are pulling out all the stops, breaking out, what, making the best decisions you can, working as hard as you can, calling every call you can make. It's interesting to hear you say, I, I, I made a, a significant error in judgment there. Um, what do you, I mean, is there something to be attributed there other than just getting unlucky enough, so to yeah, speak, that's what by it was. catching that um, trout? Just simply, that's what it was. And, and, and here's the deal. It was still my fault, even though we caught the trout, because I knew better. And what I mean by that is I knew there were way more trout out deeper than there was in the inside. And I knew the size was way bigger out deeper than on the Mm -hmm. inside. So I knew that if we caught, you know, four trout on the inside, three of the four were going to be them six pounders like we had caught earlier Mm -hmm. in the morning. One of the four was going to be a 12 pounder. Every other trout out in 200 had a chance to be over 15 pounds or over 12 pounds or whatever, right? So, um, yeah, so so it just I was frustrated, to say the least, um, that that happened in that manner. Yeah. And uh, it, like I said, it, after hindsight 2020, um, you know, I, uh, I felt kind of bad because I probably, to some people, maybe looked like a jerk. Hey, this guy's got a giant frown on his face, and he weighed in the second biggest box of the day, but... But right, but if you understood the the, the element and the situation, I more felt bad for Bubba and, and Lily and, and Jim that, you know, I felt in some ways like I let them down a little bit because I know how hard it is to win one of these things. Sure. And I know yeah. that it takes two great days. Right? Um and because mm-hmm. it takes two great days, you can't flutter on one of those days, you know, you can't give back any pounds. Mm -hmm. And I felt like we gave up five to 10 pounds there. And Mm -hmm. that was really, you know, really a concern for me. So you just said you were frustrated. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that, but then we need a new word to describe Sunday morning that isn't frustrated. It's gotta be frustrated squared or something because I'll share a quick story on, on Sunday morning. Um, yeah, I took the opportunity. I was with family, did a little sleeping in, woke up, but you, you never really know. I mean, I feel like if you had four adults, you were going to text me and be like, it's on, right? Nothing from Ross when I wake up, nothing a half hour later, nothing a half hour later. And I can't resist at this point. And I send a text and I go, Hey buddy. <laughs> and I just get back, not a bite on Sunday morning. Now, I'll let you set the rest of the stage, but I, I don't mean to give the ending away. But, but I just, Melody is in the kitchen with me, my wife, Melody, and I just look at her and I go, and she goes, is is everything okay? Like, she must have thought the boat had sunk, right? <laughs> like, you, you know, the motors didn't start in the morning, and I'm like, Russ doesn't have a bite. And she's like, ooh. Ouch. Right? And she's gotten to know you well enough over the years to know, like, when you're trying really hard and take it from me, this, this, this is not the hype train. You catch them when you're trying really hard. And we just said, you're trying really hard and you didn't have a bite. I mean, just what is going on on Sunday morning with the field, with you? I mean, this was just, this was a TV show. This is like watching the NASCAR race for the crashes, right? I mean, you just cannot believe this is happening. I couldn't take my eyes off of it, but yeah, so, I mean, felt sick about the, it at the same the, time. The only good news about it, and there really wasn't any good news, but the only good news about it was it was like <laughs> 540 and I had already gotten like six different boats texting me. So I knew it wasn't happening, right? Like, so I, I, I knew that, you know, six of the other guys in the top 15 were already <laughs> messaging me going, anything? And I'm going... Nope. And they're, they're almost all saying, nope. You know, so it's like, okay, all right. So it's not happening. That was definitely a curveball I didn't expect, right? I'm standing up there ready to swing the bat. And uh, I expected a, a, a high heater down the middle, 90 miles an hour, you know, a couple nice king bites right away. I knew, I told the team, we went out in the morning. One of the interesting things was uh, Captain Jim, who was the, the owner of the boat, you know, he, he said this to me after the tournament. He said, on the way out in the morning, you told me it was going to be brutal this morning. He goes, that was an understatement. How did you know that? Nothing changed. And I said to him, I said, simple math. Mm-hmm. When you have a 
fairly tough fight with a lack of big kings around, and then you have 58 boats take some out of the lake and all go back to those exact same spots and expect to catch them again, those fish are gone. You're not catching them. Now there's that many less to bite. And I don't think that a whole bunch filtered in to replace them overnight. And I do honestly think that it's that tough right now. Um, right. That uh, I do think it's that tough right now that if you, you know, you go to a spot and you pick a couple off, you know, it's going to affect your next fishing because there isn't that many more to, um, you know, to replace them. So, so yeah, tough, tough sledding uh, for a start okay. to say the least. Yeah. So you, at some point, begin to scramble, right? I mean, you you have to. You this is not an exaggeration. What was the time? I can't remember. Eight forty nine. Not a bite until. No, I take that back. I take that back. No, no, no. That let me rephrase I mean, that. Eight forty nine. We bailed without a bite. I think it was more like nine fifteen before we actually physically boated okay. a fish or got a bite. I mean, that's a long time. I, having having fished just a few of these, that's the longest three hours and forty five minutes or whatever. Whatever that ends up being from the time you set up, like you say, five twenty or five thirty to to nine fifteen. Now. Some people had caught some fish at this point. I yeah, mean, so I mean, not I, you know, I had heard that some a couple of boats had caught, you know, one big king. And I had heard that, you know, some boats were already bailing the trout grounds. And, and my cousin, uh, Dave, who runs a boat called Vendetta, who got a new boat this year, he, um, he was in third. He, at about 8 o'clock, had already bailed down south because we knew there was more numbers of fish down there, which I mentioned earlier in the pre-fishing scenario he literally pulled his lines from the north area we were fishing powered down south and in 48 minutes caught his five fish i mean he just bang set down 10 pound king seven pound king on a double trout 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 done before we boated one or right at about the time we boated one he was back where we were fishing back in the 130 to the north with his five so that was a little bit frustrating i mean i would be I'd be lying if I said it wasn't, um, for sure. That was frustrating. Um, I love how the fact you say things like a little bit frustrating, right? I mean, your skin had to be crawling when he leaves and comes back and goes, hey, remember me? I was just here a minute ago and had none, and now I have five and I'm back. Are you still, still here there. and still have none? I still had right? none. Is that still the world yep. we're living in? So, so 8.49, we... <laughs> We're going to go deep. We're going to go to the deep water program, 170 to 220 east-west trolls. And we're going to put a rigger down deep for, you know, with a cowbell on it for lake trout. And, um, and it, we, you know, we go and we, we start making that pass. And I think we got out to somewhere around 200 from 130. And we take a hit. And it's a lake trout on a cowbell. And we get it. And it's a nice, like, 10, 11-pounder, um, which is what we need. And we boat it, and we're like, okay. I'm like, okay, we need five of these. You know, we get five of these 10-plus pounders. I don't know if it's going to be enough to win. Don't even know if it's going to be enough to stay in the top three, but it's going to be enough to stay respectable. You know, things are going to be tough. Um, you know, we're at least going to be able to save face. We've got a fish. You know, it's yeah. now 9.15. We've, we've got one. Um, and... There was some discussion going on mm -hmm. on the boat between Bubba and I primarily at that point of what could we do to catch more lake trout? Um, but, what you know, do we want to gamble and give up our king rods? So we, uh, we did that. Uh, we put some wire dipsies down right. deep with some tin cans on them for a while, and that didn't, that didn't work. Um, and while we kind of were doing that, we started something that didn't work out very well, which was we proceeded to lose. It's debatable on the boat. I remember seven. They remember eight. But it's irrelevant at this point. Either seven or eight lake trout at, in a row. And basically what was happening was when I fish lake trout, I fish with downriggers using rubber bands. And um, 
this particular bolt I'm fishing <clears> on <throat> uses a release called a Black's release, which is fine. Um, but with the heavy weight of the cowbell, there was so much pressure there that even if we jammed that Black's release down as hard as we could, cranked it down so that it was took as much force as possible to pull that out of there, because the cowbell pulls so hard, any basic added pressure at all would pop that out of the release. Well, the issue is when you're fishing 200 down on a downrigger and it pops it out of the release, that rod instantly flies up in the air and gets slack line. So in them six or seven bites, a couple of them were like rod bang down up, couple of head shakes like this and gone by the time you grab them. Those are not six pound lake trout. We had some six pound lake trout bites. We caught a couple of six pound lake trout. Right. They didn't do that. Okay, um, so that was frustrating. And a couple of them we got our hands on, kind of backed right. up, reeled, got a couple head pounds and gone. I was upset at this point. So now it's 1045. We've proceeded to lose seven or eight in a row. Um, I'm trying everything I can with wrenches and anything I can think of to try to tighten these releases down to catch these fish. I'm frustrated. I'm grabbing the rod. Bubba's frustrated. I'm talking two trout in particular Ripped it off the ball, giant head shakes, peeling line out. Now, I know from experience that takes a 15-plus pound lake trout to pull line out 200 feet down. Gone by the time we can get to the rod. We're now at the point where, I mean, it's, it's one rod at this point. We're at the point where we're two men standing there, basically just ready to grab it and can't catch it. So the next one takes off at about 1045, and Bubba does something different. Instead of grabbing the rod out of the holder, he just starts reeling instantly to try to create immediate pressure. And we catch that one. And I, if I remember right, I think that was a nine pounder. So, so we're sitting at two. Well, now I'm getting desperate, right? So one of the advantages to the boat that I fished on is it has a lot of downriggers. And it also has a very large wide beam, 16 feet to be exact. Um, so I said to Bob, I'm going to do something mm -hmm. I generally don't do, which is we're going to pile drive three cowbells down deep. And for those of you that don't know what a cowbell is, I've been talking about them all winter, but this is a salmon candy cowbell right here. Um, this one, this particular one is called Charlie's Special. And basically what it is, is it's a, it's a long piece of wire with three, you know, rotating blades on it. And then we run one of these spinning glow rigs behind it. And we rig these 24 inches behind the cowbell and we put this on a downrigger 10 to 20 feet behind the ball. And, and that number of variance is based on this. If we're bouncing the bottom with the downrigger ball, I run them 10 feet behind the ball. If we're running it suspended just off the bottom, I run it 20 feet behind the ball. So we were running them 20 feet behind the ball um, because I found out also at this point we didn't have enough cable to get to the bottom in the deeper water, which was also a miscue on my part. Because as the, uh, you know, boss of the deck, I guess, so to say. Yeah, you're, you're, you know, you're running the fishing department in this. Right, I'm running the fishing department in this particular tournament and boat. Um, I should have tested that, and I didn't. So we could only get, I think it was 201, 199, and 197 out of the three downriggers when it was all said and done. You literally ran them out of cable. Yeah, all the way to the knot. All the way to that. So, and I would have had them, you know, 230, 240, 220, something like that, had I been able to. Um, sure. And I think this ends up costing us a little bit too, by the way. We, uh, we didn't get the big bites that I think we would have got, or as many of them, if we okay. could have got to the, to the bottom. Okay. So it's 1045. We're now two for eight. Or no, two for nine or 10, excuse me, on Lake Trout. And I'm, I'm, I'm high shrung would be a, a great term for it. Um, if, if you could imagine a guy drinking four energy drinks in a row and his eyes about to bulge out of his head, that's exactly where I was at this point. So yeah. we now are dumping three cowbells down on riggers deep. We're doing something I'm not normally accustomed to doing, but we're desperate. We're looking for three more and really we're looking for like five or six more bites in the next hour and 45 minutes to try to hope to get three over 10 pounds. So we've got a, you know, 11, 12 pounder in the cooler and we've got a nine pounder in the cooler. Um, we bought another nine pounder. Uh, we bought about another 10 pounder. I do think we miss a few more. 
And are they coming on the center rigger, or are these other things you're dumping down there working? So now all of them are starting to go. Yep, all of them are starting to go. So we're getting bites on all of them. Wonder, okay. A Wonder Bread cowbell, an antifreeze cowbell, and a silver scale mm-hmm. cowbell. And to be okay. 100% boldly truthful, it was those three because it was the only three I had. Good point. I intended to run one. I brought two backups in case we broke something off. Yeah. With no, they all and they, they all went on. And I'm literally just digging through my <laughs> lake trout box to find spinning wheels. Yep, there's a Wonder Bread one behind you. Yeah. Yep, so that ends up being the one that catches the big one as well that we're going to get to here in a little bit. So we're 1045, we're getting to about 1130, and we're sitting at 4. And I think right around that 1130, 1145 mark, we hit our fifth one, which is not a good one. It's like a six or seven pounder. But we've got five. So at this point, we're sitting at about, I figure we're sitting in the low to mid 40s. Okay. Meantime, <clears throat> my cousin Dave went and got his five. He figures he's sitting in the low 40s. So we're in the same ballpark. And we hear, you know, through the grapevine that Safe Money, who is the leading boat, figures he's got in the 50s. And he's sitting pretty good. Mm-hmm. So we end up catching, I think, one more maybe in that same six, seven pound class and maybe miss a bite. It's now noon and we make a swoop to the inside a little bit. We had kind of shortened our pass now. I could only get bit from 190 to 220. So I wasn't making the 160 to 220 pass anymore. We didn't get any good bites inside of 190. Any bites at all, really. So we swoop in and my dad calls me and he come he comes out on his midday charter. My dad works for Dumper Dan Charters, if you don't know. He calls me and he says, Hey, he says, what's going on? I said, eh, man, tough. So we're still grinding, just got our fifth. You know, pretty slow. And he's like, Okay, he's like, Well, I just put in a twenty pound trout, a nineteen pound trout, and a fifteen pound trout since I set up at ten thirty. You know, my mouth goes Thanks, my mouth goes And I'm like and it's quarter to 12 and you're calling me now? <laughs> and he's like, well, you know, I figured you were getting them. I'm like, well, we ain't getting them. <laughs> and he's like, well, right. He's like, well, right here, like this 170 to 190, I'm right here. And I can see him. He's, I don't know, three quarters of a mile away from us on the inside. Sure. So this is where tournament decisions come into play, right? So I hang up the phone with him and I tell Jim, that's my dad right there, turn towards him, Right. And while I'm telling him that, I'm going, do I really want to do that? We've fished 160 to 220 for hours and spent a third or more of our time in dead water. We didn't get any bites inside of 190, and he's catching them in there. And you don't know what you, yeah, you don't know what your dad is running exactly. You don't know the circumstances exactly, so it could be hard to chase that, even though he's catching them, right? What I do know is that he's getting the right bites. And at this point, I knew we were down to enough time that I was looking for two to three bites. You know, it's like, it's literally like noon. I think it's like like actually noon right now. So we make a swoop to the inside, make a swoop past him, not a bite. He goes past us fighting another big one. So that's frustrating a little bit, right? And now I'm thinking, okay, now it's 10 after 12. We're talking about the fact that we've got like 1230, the pump's got to come out of the water. 1245, we got to be, the boat's got to be moving at full speed towards the harbor. We're doing the math. So we're figuring, okay, it's, it's a little after 12. We've got basically 30 real minutes of fishing time left. And I'm thinking, okay, there's two options here. We can, we're in like 190 at this point. We kind of made a swoop through 170 and back to 190. We're at 190 at this point, almost straight out. Do we just head it to the harbor? Pray for like a miracle big king bite or a nice trout um, and save some time? Or do Mm -hmm. I go back to where we got bit, right? And I'm thinking, okay, we got three cowbells going now. We've had bites on all of them. I actually believe that the three of them down there are good. They're not creating too much disturbance. It's working. I told Jim, I said, turn it east. He kind of looked at me and he's like, out? And I'm like, east. Yep. He turns it out and we, we die. 
we hadn't gone in that two hour period, we hadn't gone 15 minutes without a trip on a downrigger the entire time. We don't get a bite. It's now 1230. We now hear from the headquarters, safe money's got 54, five. We already did the math. It didn't take long. We need a 57, seven. Right. We got about mid forties. It's over. You know, it's basically over. Mm -hmm. Um, Barring a miracle 20 pound salmon at the buzzer, you know, it's over. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. 1230 hits, tell Bubba and Lily, pull the, pull the pumps. So, we're pulling the pumps, everybody's kind of pulling them. And we get all the pumps in, all the pump rods put away. And I said, All right, unfortunately, it's 1240, time to pull the riggers. And I get that out of my mouth and take one step to the boom down rigger. And right as I'm looking at it, it trips off the ball goes directly down and starts peeling line out. And I go running over there and grab it, and I instantly know this is the one. Like, whether it's the one to win or whether it's not, or this is the bite we were waiting for and trying for for the last three hours. Like, this is the one we mm-hmm. were fishing for. And I get it, get it in my hands, <laughs> and I tell Jim instantly, Jim, neutral. We got three riggers out at this point, neutral. Not gonna, I'm not going to let this thing go any further than it has to. We're not going to get any further away from it than it has to. We're in crunch time. It's 1240. we got to be on the go by 1245. And I know it's a nice one. So I told Bubba and Lily, get the riggers up. They got the other two riggers up. They're working on that. Jim comes to the back of the boat. He's helping them get the balls in and everything. At that point, I hand it to Bubba so I can get the net. We have one rule kind of on that boat. Bubba does everything really, really well. He doesn't net any fish. No matter what, under any circumstances, he never nets a fish. We have two rules. Bubba doesn't net any fish, and he doesn't back my truck up in a walleye tournament. As long as we don't do those two things, we're in really great shape because we've tried that, and it didn't didn't work. Yeah, it didn't work. So, um, So I grab the net, right, and... I'm asking Jim, what time is it? He's like, 12.45. I'm like, how much time we got? He's doing the math. He's punching up the harbor, like up on the back. Here this 73-year-old man is running from, you know, the front of a 43-footer to the back of a 43-footer, trying to communicate and figure out what's going on. We're laying dead in the water. And he's like, we got to be going by 12.50 to make it by a minute or two at full speed. I'm like, okay, so it's 45. We got five minutes. He says five minutes. It comes up to the surface, and it's a big trout. And it does like this giant three-time head thrash that I was, I'll dream about for the rest of my life, throwing alewives out of its mouth as it's doing it. But it does it 15 feet behind the boat. So I can't get it. It decides to then splash back down and directly go down to 81 feet like it's an adult king salmon at hyperspeed, just right down below the boat. My heart about dropped. You know, I thought we were going to sneak this yeah. thing in. We kind of had we kind of had it in disguise. We're going to sneak this thing yeah. in, net it, get on the go, and make it back. And whatever happens, happens, right? Nope, different idea. We're now going back down to the bottom. We're not gonna we're not gonna you know let these guys these fools catch me. Um, I'm staring right. at seven or eight alewives laying on the surface back there that had just puked up a giant trout pile of driving mm-hmm. to the bottom. So I make this interesting decision that I'm going to jump the back of the boat and get on the swim platform, which I've never done before, slip and almost fall in, right? Because I'm telling myself the next time this thing hits the surface, I'm going for it regardless. And on, on this yeah. particular 43-foot boat, there's a pretty wide gunnel. So it's, it's you know, you're substantially further back inside the boat than you are on the swim platform. It's probably yeah. a six or seven foot deal. I'm on the swim platform. We maybe get that trout the first time, but I've never been back there. We've never netted anything back there before. Um, but I wasn't. So I get back there. So now I got Jim holding my belt. Bubba's fighting the fish directly below the boat like this, just throbbing the rod. Lily's trying to just do whatever she can to help in any manner possible by moving stuff, grabbing stuff, doing stuff. She's flipping down riggers in, flipping down riggers out as we're moving along the edge of the boat. And he brings it up and I see it and it comes up under the boat and I net it. And when I net it, I immediately throw the net in the boat, jump in the boat and Jim guns it. We start going. 
And, you know, we're excited. We're high five and we have no idea what the, you know, what the end result's going to be. But what we know is that at this point, we finished off the day with one of the most exciting endings I've ever had to a tournament. I've had some pretty exciting endings. This would be one of them. Um, and as I commented to a couple of people, this to me in, in salmon fishing would be like, you know, hitting a fadeaway three at the buzzer and nothing but net. You know, this was the closer uh-huh. deal. Um, and uh-huh. we weighed it. And on our scale, it was like 17, nine, eight. And we're literally punching it up in the phone on the way in. And we're coming up with 57, six, six, and we need 57, six, five. We're like, wow, like this is going to be really close, like really close. And we have no clue because we didn't weigh any the day before. If our scale is a little heavy or our scale is a little light compared to tournament trail. So we come in, we get in line to weigh in. And I said to Bubba, one thing we're going to do that we don't normally do is Scotty likes to, Scotty Max, the guy that runs tournament trail, he likes to weigh your 333 fish first. So you take one, put it in, he weighs it, you take it out, put your other one in or whatever you're going to weigh for that day. We had two slots to fill. So I said to Bubba, I said, we're not doing that. We're not letting them lose any slime. Lake trout tend to poop all over the place and lose weight. Spit out some alewives they got in their mouths yet. Uh, we keep these fish in water in, in a live well that Jim has in his boat. So half these fish are alive yet when we're putting them in the, the cooler. I'm like, we're not, we're gently putting them in the scale. So I told Scotty, I said, we're putting all five in. And I told Bubba, leave the big one for last. I don't want to know. Because I knew that based on the size of the big one, I'd know instantly on our scale how it was going to pan out. So he jams the, the four smaller ones in there and then puts the big one in there. And we end up with 58 pounds even, which was 0.45 pounds enough. So that was a absolute mm-hmm. crazy 849 to 1249 time period i mean it, and it's as rare i mean all of that you just think about all the things that all the bets you could have won that says russell gahagan in full-blown tournament mode in his home port in june is not going to get a king salmon bite from 5 a.m to 1 p.m like that seems like you could probably fish Every day in June, you could get out past the pier heads. If you were trying that hard, is there another day in any given June that you don't get a single king salmon bite of any size? I mean, doesn't seem like it would be very many, right? And so for it to come on Sunday, Salmon Cup, after you caught a pile of them on Thursday, there, right? That That is just sort of the best and worst of tournament fishing, I suppose, for you, right? Yeah, so it did two things for me, Matt. It it really did. It 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 humbles you. It absolutely does. It has to. Um if it doesn't, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. But what it also did was it showed me something that that I was really excited about. And this is probably from an excitement level, one of my favorite wins of all time. And here's why. It showed me that All the years of trying to be a very good and well-rounded fisherman mattered because, quite frankly, I don't think there's a lot of guys in that event that could have shuffled from Kings to Trout at 9 o'clock and pulled 50. Well, you know, there was maybe one or two 50-pound catches of Trout, so not many guys could do it. And then the other thing it did is, you know, I've spent a lot of time and a lot of hard work, as you know, because you and I are close, building this brand called Salmon Candy. And we were able to shuffle the two main species that people fish tournaments for on Mm -hmm. Lake Michigan without ever using something that wasn't in the Salmon Candy brand, ever. Mm -hmm. And that really was important to me because Mm -hmm. it it meant that what I was trying to do and what I was doing was was working. You know, Mm -hmm. we could put on the gear that we're designing, building, and manufacturing right in-house and... Um, we didn't need anything else. You know, right. the stuff we're making is the right stuff. At the risk of, so I don't want to make you sort of beat your own chest on this. So I'll I'll do some of it for you. But I mean, so my, my own parents, my mom started making fishing tackle uh, and the kitchen table when I was four or five years old, and you know she did so so she could stay home with me. And it's a long and illustrious story. But long story short, she she might have 
handled more individual fishing jigs than anyone alive in North America today. I mean, millions and millions and millions and millions of them, literally, over the course of 30 years. And I say that because I, I, I know what it's like firsthand to have to do this, right? This is not a get-rich-quick scheme, let's say that. It, it's, it's probably not even a get-rich-slow scheme. <laughs> it, it is a brutal business with a ton of work, but having gotten to know the people who are back there working on this stuff from Rachel, your kids, I, I don't want to start dropping names because I'll leave someone out, but whether you're at the front counter in that shop, you're in the back manufacturing room, I mean, people are paying for their kids' school activity fees by by doing this stuff. And the, the one really crucial thing, and I've said this to charter captains here in Port Washington and friends of mine, when you and I fish together, we fish and we probably put stuff we're convinced is going to work out on half the rods or less. And, and we put stuff out that we really have no idea if it's going to work, to be honest, on half the rods or more. And you have tested way more stuff that's never seen the light of day then you've tested stuff that comes out the next day, right? The the blue stud last June that has become the hottest flasher on Lake Michigan is the exception and not the rule. You just don't tape stuff up and have it work. And the thing that I give you credit for, and the reason I think this tournament thing with Salmon Candy works under pressure is if something looks good but doesn't work, it's gone. It's back in the back drawer, hanging in the back manufacturing room, and you look back on it and go, man, why does that thing suck? Why does that thing not work? It should work. But it doesn't, so it doesn't get made. It doesn't get sold. It doesn't get the Salmon Candy brand. It doesn't get the Russell Gahagan stamp of approval. And, you know, you don't have 500 colors of everything. People would buy 500 colors mm -hmm. of stuff. But it, it dilutes the entire operation, right? And so coming from a tournament background to this goes a long ways. Now you can, you know how to market, you know how to design, but um, I think there are a lot of people who can design cool baits and buy tape and manufacture things, whether it's in their house and, and more power to them. By all means, do your thing, enjoy the sport any way that you care to enjoy it. Um, but salmon candy at its core is a sort of a tournament winning, tournament proven brand. That's what it's there for. And the moment something stops working or didn't work to begin with, it just doesn't make it on the wall. It doesn't work every day in every place. Um, so I, I say that almost on your behalf, because if you say it, then it sounds like you're, you know, playing big shot or you're trying to say something like, oh, look, look at how I'm different. But I mean it. I mean, I've, I've been in this industry, so to speak, having watched it forever. And that's not the norm. I mean, typically the first question a, a manufacturer asks is, can I sell it? Will people buy it? Can I make money on it? Your first question is, will it work? Like, is this going to be something that I will personally use in a tournament under circumstances where I need it to work? Um, that's where the, the plastic bladed cowbells and custom colors comes from and, and the flies and all, you know, I mean, all sorts of stuff. And so um, I give you credit. I'm biased. I get it. I'm, you know, I'm a close friend of yours and fish with the stuff, but um, it's not the only stuff that works by any stretch, but I can tell you that if it's got that label on it, it's been tested and it's worked someplace at least once because if it didn't work and, and probably many times over it just it doesn't get to get um it just doesn't pass the test it doesn't get manufactured um you have any comment on on that or any response to that no, yeah yeah that no i appreciate you saying it you're 100 percent accurate and i think one of the things that'd be interesting to at least note is and i told you this We've talked so much about in the past about hot baits, broken in tackle, things like that. Here's how much confidence I have in this stuff. Um, Jim, the owner of the Class E that I fished on, bought a bunch of salmon candy stuff for his boat this off season because he'd seen the success we've had on it when I've brought our stuff on, my yeah. stuff, your stuff, whatever, on in the years past. And he, he asked me, he said, hey, he said, we, you know, I bought a bunch of stuff. We've got all the right stuff. We'll just use my stuff. And then if you need to fill a couple things in, like naturally he didn't buy cowbells because he fishes in Sturgeon sure. Bay and doesn't fish lake trout. So I brought some cowbells and he didn't even know about the fish blades yet. So I brought some fish blades, but, but he had the flashers and he had the flies. We fished everything brand new out of the package. Brand new. I did not tie anything up. Nothing. We fished it exactly the way 
you walk into the Sheboygan or the Appleton location or you go onto the Salmon Candy website or the TRS website and buy it. The same leader that comes out of the same bag, the same fly that comes out of the same bag, there was no secret weapon. Not one. There was not a, we had something mm-hmm. nobody else had. Nothing. I mean, we fished all you of did the same stuff. You when you were pre-fishing and you had fish blades working. <laughs> but unfortunately, the fish got the memo and didn't have that going from the account. You're, you're, you're actually, you're, you're not wrong. And thanks for pointing it out. But you're not 100% right only because we did release some oh, on yeah, Black right. Friday. And there are other people. And I haven't even got to share this with you personally yet. But I had, and I'm going to. For his sake, I'm going to leave it out. But I had a, a fellow tournament fisherman call me yesterday who found the same program on Thursday and then had it fizzle out for him later in the week. Very interesting. Like, just in communicating yesterday on a recap of the tournament, like you and I did, him and I did, and he literally brought it up before I did. And then, of course, I naturally explained to him I had the same thing going. So he had it, so I wasn't sure. the only one. And he had bought all those on sure. Black Friday. Uh, when we ran that special, but um, what I was going to say was my best spin and glow literally was the mm. Hulk UV out of the bag. Like I pulled it out of the bag, threw it on the, the antifreeze cowbell and jammed it down and, and bang. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's just a, it, it, I'm proud of it. I, I'm, I'm absolutely proud of it. I'm happy to say it. Um, you know, we feed some families on it, not just mine. There's other employees and stuff that work here. And, uh, and that's why it means so much to me. It means way more than the rest. Um, you know, maybe it'll be my last tournament win. Maybe it won't be, maybe I'll win 10 more, but, um, this one was special to me probably because of the fact that I've worked really hard for a long time to be what I feel like is a well-rounded salmon and trout tournament fisherman on Lake Michigan. And I think if you want to be a very good tournament fisherman on Lake Michigan, you got to be well-rounded. Um, you can't just be a king fisherman. You can't just be a lake trout fisherman. You got to know how to catch steelhead offshore. Um, and I feel like I can do all those things at a high level. And then, you know, we're working really hard to make products that will help you do all those things at a high level. And I spent all winter and put my reputation on the line telling people how to do this at a high level. And all I did was exactly what I told them how to do it, when to do it, and why to do it, yeah. and it worked. Little adversity goes a long ways, and, and the fact that they didn't chew your fingers off in the setup, and the fact that you went all those hours without bites and made the transition. I I give you credit. I've said it for a long time. I say it at the seminars. I say it publicly here. I mean, there's there are people who talk on the internet a lot about catching them. Um, there are a lot of people who know how to catch them. There's a lot of wonderful... Uh, Charter businesses all up and down the lakeshore with really successful charter captains uh, and, and terrific people, um, young and old. But once in a while, it's interesting to have 58, ba- 58 boats pay a bunch of money to show up and just see see what happens. Uh, one last question, and I, we've been talking for a long time, and I'll let you go. I know you got a shop to run and everything else, and i got to run to work too, but what do you make of – the, the tournament scene, not for you personally, but you know, it was interesting to me. I go look at the tournament trail website and I see you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 events, whatever, up and down the Michigan Lakeshore. It seems like every weekend you could be in something not here. Now, I'm not a tournament person. I, I have no real interest in, in fishing tournaments, but I have to believe that I'm a little unique there. There has to be some people. Is it the chicken or the egg? Are there not the anglers who want it, or are there not the people organizing it to, to draw the anglers in? What what gives other than the Sheboygan Salmon Cup with a, a record turnout this year? Well, I think that overall the participation in 2021, my expectation is going to be high. It's going to be up. Um, and, and it could be a bunch of things. You know, maybe people aren't doing other stuff because we've had a couple of tough, tough years here with a pandemic. Maybe it's the... The fishery, in my opinion, is on the rise. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably a helpful situation. Um, maybe it's because people have more money today than they did a year or two ago. You know, I mean, I think it's public knowledge that, you know, um, the government has been very supportive of people and people, some people, not all, but some people are in better situations than they were before. You know, there's a lot of reasons you can think. Um, there's new ownership of the tournament trail. Mm-hmm. And to be quite frank, I think the new ownership's doing a good job because they're pouring a bunch of cash into it. People love money. Um, and I've always said that money wasn't my motive to fish tournaments, never has been. And if it ever becomes, I won't do it anymore because it's a losing cause. Um, but it does interest other people. 
uh, a lot of other sure. people. Uh, if, if, the, if, if the prize money is twice as much as it was last year, that draws attention. Mm-hmm. And that is some of what's going on, I think, as well. Um, and then, quite frankly, I feel like, you know, and I'm happy to say this, I feel like working really hard all winter, mm-hmm. educating people, mm-hmm. fired people up to fish. I saw a lot of people that were at our salmon school that were, um, you know, that were in the shop that were fairly new fishermen yeah. that got involved in the tournament. And I'm so, so happy and thankful that they did. And I, I, I think a lot of them probably struggled a little bit this weekend, but I, I hope and pray that they don't lose sight of the fact that it's a learning experience and they'll just continuously get better. And the only way they're going to get better is if they continue to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you just quit now and be like, well, that didn't work. I got beat up. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, you're right. You probably did, but you won't do any better next time if there isn't a next time. Right. So um, I think there's a lot of exciting things going on in the salmon world right now. Uh, a lot of exciting things going on in tournament fishing. Mm-hmm. And I think if Tournament Trail does a really good job of promoting these events, talking about them, recapping them, doing all this kind of stuff, it's only going to keep people interested more. And we've got some really good tournaments coming up later in the year here. We've got, you know, Samarama coming up in a mm-hmm. few weeks. KD is going to be going on up in the northern half of the of the, the system here. Um, the Sheboygan Coho Derby is now a nine-day derby, and I think they're still doing their super tournament for a couple of days. You know, Mantuoc has a super der- ter- derby and a, and a derby 4th of July time frame. Two Rivers does. I think Port does. So, you know, there's a whole but Bruce City is, tournament yeah. down in Milwaukee. Yep, Bruce City. Yep. So there's a whole bunch of different things going on here for the rest of the summer, and I, I expect the numbers to be really good at a whole bunch of those. And I encourage people to fish them. Um, it doesn't have to be blood and guts. You can have fun doing it. And uh, hopefully, um, you know, people can continuously fish these events and, uh, you know, be successful in some. You won't be successful in all of them, as you said before. I, I use this stat line, you know, as a pride thing, but also as a reality thing. This was my 11th tournament trail victory, but I've also fished closing in on 50 events. Hmm. So, you know, it, it takes a lot to, um, you know, to be successful. And even though I've been blessed enough to win 11 of them, you know, I've, I've lost, you know, 37 of them or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So, um, we'll see what, what happens, but I appreciate you taking the time today to do a little recap of the salmon cup. And, uh, I think, a lot of people will enjoy this. Yeah, if there's, you know, any feedback that people have, if they'd like to see more of this. I, the, the thing that I hear from people, you know, when they see us fishing together on videos and things is, is I get a lot of questions. Not surprisingly, they're not that interested in my thoughts, but they, you know, I get a lot of questions like, you know, what, what does Russell do when, you know, when you guys were out, what was Russell doing on, you know, which is totally justified and, and totally reasonable and totally expected. Um, what that what that tells me is a lot more than just a handful of people I'm bumping into on the dock or at the landing have these questions. So I'm happy to try to, you know, crack in there and, and get an understanding of, of your thinking and, and disseminate it out into a larger population. If I was going to do a commercial, one thing that I would tell people is you do salmon schools in the winter. Um, I've been a part of some of them, but it's not my information, right? Sometimes I'm disseminating your information and sometimes you are, but they are really helpful. And I've gotten a lot of feedback from people that say, you know, I've gotten pictures and texts and Facebook posts from people who have succeeded on that information. You just succeeded on your own information over the weekend. Um, uh, congratulations. Seriously, that was a, that was a big deal. Um, I, I don't know what to say about it other than you did it again. I, I'm, you know, proud of you. I'm proud of that whole crew and, um, thanks to the tournament trail for making the trip over Scotty and that whole crowd, everybody who owns that thing, it's neat. And, uh, the big thing is I just, I hope everybody keeps enjoying the summer out there, you know, take your families, take your kids, take your buddies, um, get up early one day. You're not going to be able to do it. Whether the fishery isn't as good, whether you're not feeling well enough, you know, um, I, I know, uh, the alarm bells are early. It's late night. Sometimes it's windy, but, you'll be glad you did go when, when you can't go anymore. So um, thanks to you for letting me host this a little bit today and chat with you. All right. Well, I appreciate it. And that was Thank the, uh, that was the morning buzz with Matt Clinton and Russell Gahagan doing a little recap of the Sheboygan salmon cup. Mm-hmm.